In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. God bless you. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effective grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effective grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effective grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known to the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. Hold on. Good evening. Welcome to the oh. 6 p.m. Angela's Prayer Challenge. Okay, where's my invisibility cloak? I'm supposed to be invisible. Oh, you wanted to ruin it. Okay, that's okay. okay Give it to we, her. Can we close it up yeah, again? Close, close. Welcome to the 6 a.m., no, 6 p.m. Angela's Prayer Challenge, APC Level 12. You are watching, oh wait, I am Patrick Campbell, and this is my beautiful, invisible wife, Joy. Hello, honey. And you are watching Joyful wait, Hope. What, what am I supposed to do, yeah, you, you, you can, yeah. I'm just like this and talk. Yeah, you're just invisible. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I, I just wore my invisible cloak. Yes. I'm part of the host. I'm Joy. <laughs> yes. And we are the Campbells. We're with Talon, Iggy, some squeaky dogs, and Invisible Wife. And you're watching Joyful Hope TV. Live from the Joyful Hope studio. At the House of Prayer for All Peoples. Serviam! Serviam, we are here to serve. And you, our family here. Welcome, so, everyone. Can I just show myself yeah, a bit? Yeah, you can, a yeah, you can bit? Just, just, just your head. Just, just yeah. my hands. Okay. Hi, everyone. Just see my I tell you, <laughs> you know, she's always here, except she just, she's invisible. Hey, right? don't go to my and phone. And sometimes, sometimes she just has to be I invisible. I have to do my. <laughs> yeah. That's that cute? so funny. <laughs> We're having <laughs> okay, AUZ Nobatu Nostra Presenza Muni Amur. Which means may he strengthen us with his presence at the moment of our death. Amen. Okay, so, we, so we went to a funeral, so let's just say uh, 
um, prayer for Tracy. Oh, okay. Eternal okay. rest, rest grant to, to Tracy, Tracy, O Lord, and let, let her perpetual light, light shine upon her. May she, she rest in peace. peace. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's see. Who are, who are winners? Let's drum roll, please. Adam. Adam. Adam is a winner. He is the winner continually. Okay? And then who else? Angela what? Hudson. Angela Hudson. The beautiful Angela Hudson, which we miss very much. Okay, let's say Hail Mary for these two lovely families. Hail Mary, full, full of, of grace, grace, the Lord, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay. Your voice is a bit soft. You need more mic. Um, I can get pretty loud. I like loud. to be intense. Okay. I like to get really loud. But there was there was a couple of things that uh, that we, uh, I wanted to mention and bring up about um, uh, Tracy. We were praying for Tracy, and uh, she was she was a beautiful young mom who was pregnant um, and had some tumors and and some cancers, and it looked really bad, and, and, and we had a lot of prayer warriors. And we were speaking to uh, Tracy's mom today after Mass, and she says, I, she was the only one, Tracy's mom, I'm not going to say who her name is, because I don't have permission, but everybody who, the family that was leaving, proceeding out of the church today, were crying and sad. And, and it's okay. I mean, everyone deals with death in a different way. But I want to say that Tracy's mom had a glow. She had a she had a glow and a confidence and an assurance that Tracy, her daughter, was in a better place. And and it and it just warmed my heart as Catholics that we know that. You know, that we know that God is good and he takes us in the right moment. Now that doesn't mean We're not that, sad or that we we're don't not grieve. sad or we don't grieve. I think the Blessed Mother grieved, even though the Blessed Mother knew that Jesus was gonna come back ten days. Those three days without him reminded her, I bet you, of when she lost him in the temple. Yeah. And Catherine, she was without. Yeah, Catherine was even saying that the, her mom uh, is a part of the choir. Wow, and, and the choir was awesome. It was awesome. Majestic. She was singing so beautifully. You know, it's the same way like when my grandma died. I we you, yes, you I sang, sang, I, I sang played lead. the piano in Saskatoon. And it it was, was in Saskatoon when this happened. And the kids were still little. Talon was still like, what, 14. eight, 14, he was 15, still, 16. He was still muckalit. Yeah. Which and, means Talon. You know, <laughs> it's really hard, though, but... No, but you was also she... also sang for my dad, right? Yeah, I did. I all played for I was, my dad when yeah. he passed away. Um, it was it was beautiful to be able to take part in their funerals and and still have that hope. But what what I was I was so um, it was amazing the strength and the faith that she had and that she was happy, and um, and and that's not saying that anybody was wrong, right? There were a couple of things that um, you know the priest said that I wanted to talk about today because it's really important. He. He said, you know, it was amazing. I'm, I'm here listening to his homily um, about Tracy. And he said he, he didn't know her. But what he gathered is she worked in healthcare and she, she took care of people who had Alzheimer's or dementia. Wow. And then he went, he said, that person who takes care of people who have dementia or Alzheimer's is a very special uh, person. Now, all of a sudden, the Lord was like pulling my heartstrings because I related to you her able and this to. is like not everybody can handle someone who has dementia um and care for someone who's who is who has um a disability in that way kathy simone is one of them um there are many healthcare providers that you have to like pull on the patience of god right and kind of remember okay they don't mean that you know you, you make excuses for diane, them because, all over too right yes diane and, and it's 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 very very um it's it's a it's a moment where you're, um, 
It's like you're helping Jesus on the cross, like Simon, um, who carries the cross with Jesus. He didn't want to. He's like, I'm not a criminal. I'm not. I don't want to do. I got things to do. And then they made him take care of Jesus and pick up the cross. And it wasn't until he was under the cross, carrying it with Jesus, that he realized what a struggle he was. And then at the end of his trip to through Calvary with Jesus. He started to defend Jesus, and he did not want to be separated from Jesus because he knew that, you know, that they were going to kill him, and his heart was attached to, and this is what God wants us. He wants us to just not look at our problems. He wants us to embrace them. He wants us to embrace those people in our lives that are difficult, and that's the hardest thing to do. You you know, um, I remember, um, you know, during his homily, the priest was so touched that he said, I, I, I think she's a saint already. And he canonized her right there. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, I could hear my old spiritual director say, never canonize anyone. Never say that they are strictly straight going to heaven. We have to do and our part to, to pray, pray for, for them everyone. in purgatory, <laughs> right? Cause, and this is, this is the deal. I think we kind of lose sight that, that we should, it's a big, good, healthy Catholic exercise for us to assume that everyone, you know, at least, you know, our loved ones made it to at least purgatory and that we pray for them um, and pray for them to get out of purgatory, to be purified. You know, you want to quicken this purgatory. So what you're saying is um, to be on the safe side, because we, this is the, the journey of a person is between God and his soul. Uh, we don't assume, we don't presume, you know, right. so we, we give them uh, what should be from for the church militant. We have to fight. And because they can't fight for themselves in purgatory. Yeah, so and, and they might stop be... stop praying for them. Yeah, it might lengthen their purgatory, but we can assist them because there will be... Um, like this was revealed to me in many uh, mystical... Uh, opportunities that there are also from the lives of saints though where some souls are almost near purgatory but they have to stay at a certain spot until they're purified of yes. something so it's like it's like i mean going into a place where you're you have to go to a wedding and you're going to the wedding feast and you know you don't have the proper tear. You know that you need to take a shower. Just like when we were going from AC, APC, I came in, my face was all red for sawdust. I was just all sweaty and I had to come in before APC and wash up and change up. And now I'm in the, you know, Your garment. I'm in my garment, Heavenly my garment. holy garments, you know? Um, and so that's like with purgatory. Um, it, it is a place where, so when we cross into heaven, that there is no guilt, there's no more shame. We, we've, we've done everything that we need to do and, and gone through a purification. And it's like fire because you're, you're waiting to get to see Jesus. You know you're almost there. But I think that if we, if, now this is the one thing that I want to talk about because I wanted to say that when we have souls and we assume that they're in purgatory, and we pray for them, we can still, every day, we're asking souls to pray for us. Intercede for us. Intercede right? for us. And that's not heretical. That is very Catholic. So all the souls that are suffering in purgatory, they can't pray for themselves, but they can pray for us. And it's very, very important that we, we acknowledge those people that might be uh, in purgatory to pray for us and ask them to intercede for us. Um, and, and so... This is what my dad used to say, okay? My dad's sitting right behind me, and I hope he remembers. He would always say, pray for the souls in purgatory. Pray for the souls in purgatory. And then if I, like, I hit my hammer, or I hit my, my thumb on my hammer, he'd say, offer up the pain, offer up the pain. And I didn't understand that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But he said, offering up the pain, whatever you're going for, is you say, Lord, I'm okay with this. Use this pain, this suffering that I'm going through for the poor souls in purgatory. And it, and it seems like every time I did that, I would receive a grace that the pain just left. 
It was sort of like, I offer this up for the poor souls of prigger. And then before I get done talking, my thumb would feel better. Or my back. Or, that is the or, miracle and that is the truth. It happens. <laughs> it happens over and over and over again. Why did it go? Well, God wants you wants to encourage you to keep on praying for our, our, our militant in purgatory, right? Because they can't pray for themselves. And he wants to give you a spiritual cookie to know that, hey, this is working and they needed that. And um, and it's a very it's a very powerful tool in your arsenal, especially when you're doing spiritual warfare. So my dad said that his goal in his life was to create an army of souls in purgatory. That he would be praying for souls in purgatory till the day he died, offering up all his suffering. Even this morning when we were wrestling in the shower together, we were. What are you talking about? Well. What we had planned term? for him to take a shower, but Who? he pulled me in, and both oh, of us took a okay. shower. Right? So I thought you were taking. A shower. I was wet. He was wet. We're like, oh, okay, why? we're just gonna go with it. And he was, he was like, what are you doing to me? And I said, offer it up, Dad. Offer it up for the four souls of purgatory. He goes, yes, I remember that. So he, we offer it up for the four souls in purgatory. And my dad used to say, I'm building an army. And I said, Dad, what are you going to do with an army? He says, I'm building such a huge army of souls that when I get up to heaven and I walk up to the pearly gate and I see St. Peter, this is my dad, right, talking. St. Peter might say to me, Edmund Campbell, I don't see your name on this list. <laughs> and he said, I'd be all sweaty and like oh lord have mercy and then in the background behind the gates of heaven you would hear very faintly <laughs> and saint peter would say what what is that what is that noise and my dad said i don't know and they would get louder <laughs> And St. Peter goes, we got to check out what this is. What is that noise? And they would open up the doors a little bit, and there would be an army of souls yelling, let Ed in, let Ed in, let Ed in. And then my dad said, and that's how I got into heaven. <laughs> so that story has been told to us many times. So it's a... Uh... APC tradition to hear it over and over again. <laughs> no, <laughs> because I, I just, it brings a point, right? It brings a powerful point on, you know, how our prayers for our uh, deceased loved ones is very, very effective. And um, I have a purgatory story I love her, where our Lord stories. actually in a dream, because there's a point in your when you strive for holiness where you actually think you're holy already. And our Lord has to bring me down to a point where, hey, Joy, um, you're not really going straight to heaven. And then there's this moment of shock when you're going to be like, what? <laughs> After all the daily mass, all the novenas, all the... And I'm not going straight to heaven and all the ministry that I'm doing and how I love everyone, et cetera, et cetera. I said, what is going on, you know? So that moment when you're going to die and then Jesus will tell you on those sins of omission, you know, you want to be able to, like, have the grace to handle it now rather than later. Right. You know, the currency is different. I've said this before. It's sort of like, you know, when you go to the Philippines or Mexico or any kind of other country other than the United States, so your dollar all of a sudden is more valuable over there. And you got like a, a thousand pesos is like, you know, what, $300, you know, or something like that. I mean, it's... it's the currency exchange. The currency exchange is really, different. really different, really drastic. And so whatever we can offer up here in heaven has a lot more value, or offer up here on earth has a lot more value than when you're in purgatory. It's almost like you're, you're dealing with pennies and it's going to take you a lot longer. So and for me, it's... it's for me, I love that uh, growing up in a Catholic family, my parents was, a, you know, like you, 
uh, my parents like was able to share um, the faith you know in in the eyes of our of souls in purgatory so right from the very beginning first I learned to offer up my pain and second my parents told me that they're really praying for us so I made an experiment so young when I was you know in school and I would make them really wake me up at a certain time. Oh, you, you prayed to the souls in purgatory. To I wake prayed you up. to the souls in purgatory so they will wake me up as my alarm clock before going now, to school. When I was your age, <laughs> I would not have done that. That's a little bit too spooky. I don't want. Well, bring up Patrick. My parents were able to explain it. Did so you ever watch what's that movie? No, I, we don't. Christmas watch, Carol with. We don't watch horror movies. What's that guy? As a child, so Charles I. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Yeah. So I really didn't have. That's scary. I really didn't have that perception that souls were really, really that scary. But because what my what my parents explained is they're a great help. They I didn't visualize it as ghosts. You know, I we really know. didn't talk too much about ghosts when I was growing up. But anyway, the point of that experiment is I just wanted to know if they really do exist or not. So it always worked. They yeah. were my alarm clocks, right? Yeah. So uh, we, for everyone that will die in our community, my parents will do this litany of rosary to pray for the dead. You know, it's a tradition in the Philippines. So, you know, the poor souls in purgatory became part of my life to the point that to the present moment when they need prayers, they actually knock on me. Yeah, they, I, I, I've, I've heard <laughs> I it hear too. one um, knock. <laughs> yeah, it's a big knock. But it and, seems um, distant, but it can wake you up. It does wake us up. And and then we know that we have to pray for, for the poor souls in purgatory. We also kind of like sometimes, it, you know, we, we know that they're passing now. When I was a little kid, Troy doesn't want me to talk about it, but I seen where not everybody saw, but I saw <laughs> people that were. I mean, it's not like seeing people. I would just, you know, just like I see you, I saw somebody, and later on, I would find out that that person had passed away, but I still saw them. And so for me, that doesn't scare me. It just meant that I needed to pray for that person before the Lord to allow me to see that that person was still lingering in that situation that I had to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. So the poor souls in purgatory have been like a part of, you know, they're probably watching right now on Joyful Hope TV. We're honoring them. You know, because, because they've helped us throughout our ministry. And this is what Father Andre said. Now, Father Andre uh, is a priest friend that we met in Colorado, and he's also the guy who who did the exorcism for Donald Trump when he was in the White House the second time. And, and he gave Donald Trump the Fatima statue. He, he was telling Joy and I, and you can catch this, his message to us in the APC on... Um, I, I removed it. Oh, you did? Yeah, it's in Patreon now. Okay, so it's in Patreon. You got to sign up for Patreon. But what I loved about this message is he said that in the time where we battle the Antichrist, and as we go forward as the church militant, and when one of us dies in battle, dies working against the forces of evil for Jesus, he said, we will not die and, 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 and be taken out. He says, when we are fighting the Antichrist in Jesus' name, we will die go to and, and be and, and, and get stronger. You know, the battle is even greater. We, we will have more strength, more, more power in Jesus' name um, because now we're closer to Christ. And, and this is one of the things this that is, I have. I'm just getting an anointing here. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, God really wants to emphasize the power of the poor souls in purgatory and the power of our deceased relatives let, let when me, they make it to let, heaven. Right. Let me let me just be clear about this. When and 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 this is a download that the Lord was giving to me that that when you like a lot of times when when we're working in, in this place and we're doing evangelization and and um, we're trying to get into to do a good job for the Lord and and, and reach as many people as we can. And I remember um, we were trying to get uh, a priest, and Father Chris Alar gave us Father Mark Barrett. 
and Father Mark Barron toured with us in Ireland. And then we went to his parish over in uh, Illinois. Yes. And, and it was amazing. You know, we're working and working. And all of a sudden, Father Mark Barron gets promoted to the head of the MIC. Okay. And we're like, we know him. We know him. It's, and, and I remember Iggy said, it's like we're made. You know, we're going to, you know, we, 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 he's our friend. He's our priest. This is, this is like when your, your family members go to heaven, they're closer to Jesus. Wow. It's like they're being That's, made. These is, are the saints in the making. That is a good visual because you were, you're trying to relate how... Father Mark was nobody when we met him in Ireland. No, I was actually that. disappointed that I didn't get Father Chris Alar. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got look, Father Mark. His his place now he is an equivalent of Father Chris Alar, right in the MIC group. That's amazing. And you know, I was I was uh, chatting with him the other day, and he says, "Yes, I must I decrease. Gather. I must decrease." You know, and, and I'm like, "Dude, you made it. You know, you're the head. This is this get higher than this and I was so excited for him you know um and not that we would benefit it but I could see that you know when you when you have like a lot of people contact me and say hey can you ask father Jim to pray for me you know it was like it's like well yeah I guess you know but I can see where other people will make that connection with me and we need to make that connection to the poor souls in purgatory because they're very very close to the Lord. And this is what I I had um, reflected upon about the poor souls. Of, I took a book called The Poor Souls in Purgatory, and I was reading it and reflecting it the other day. And it, it was saying that those things, like the sins of omission, the things that we wish oh, we could have done. Oh, I am getting an anointing um, again, because right around the beginning of this episode, our Lord was saying, I want you to discuss the sins of omission. So, said, where is that coming from, this sins is of what, omission? Well, this is one of the reasons why, why we don't go straight to heaven, because there's so many things. Every time there is an opportunity or God introduces you to another person, there's a mission attached to it. There's a response that I need to do. So every evil that comes into, there is a proper response. And let's just face it. A lot of us are kind of like numb to what we're supposed to do. Like, like okay, the other day when we found a, a, a glass jar full of marijuana, I still don't know what to do with that thing. You know, I mean, do I go to the police? Do I go to the do I go to the court system? Do I talk to a police officer? Do I just bury it? Do I throw it in the ground? You know, and I'm like, I but I know that there is something I'm supposed to do, and I'm still praying on it. So here's here it is, and I know that kind of shocked you about that. But here it is. There are so many things that we haven't done because we don't know how to do or how to act. And and when I read, oh my goodness, this book, I'm getting another, and I think I'm gonna tell you why. Okay. I hope I don't All forget right. it. Lord, help me remember. What, right. So what the Lord was saying so through this book was that the soul in purgatory goes through those similar situations, and this time Jesus does the work for them, through them, to perfect them of those things that they didn't do on earth. Boom! Right? So it's, it's almost like living in the divine will. Now God's going to do that in you so you do it the right way. It's sort of like training wheels. It's like you, you, you failed here, oh, and I don't want you to go to heaven Ooh, with guilt you, and Holy shame. Spirit. I want you to be perfected so you get it right this time. So God comes in and and helps us hit the target right. Amen. Oh, that is so powerful. I wish I didn't too much react. So we could have recorded that like spot on. No, oh, it was all good. But honey. anyway, I can't stop my emotional joy. <laughs> but anyway, what I wanted to tell you is in the beginning of this episode, when we were talking about dementia and taking care of the sick, what our Lord sort of revealed, you know, when we were talking about that is um, I read that some of us have the grace to take care of uh, those with dementia and some of us don't have the grace. And our Lord corrected me in my thought process. Oh, yeah. What our Lord said, and he gave out uh, to me, like biblically put scriptures in front of my eyes and said, Blessed are the, um, 
when they asked, where are you, Jesus, you know, and Jesus said, I'm with the sick. I'm at the ill. Like, you visit, when you visit me, you actually see me, right? Or when you take care of the sick, you are actually taking care of Jesus. And when our Lord is saying that to me just now, what he was trying to say is, it's a grace, right? But what is the current state of our soul right now? How are we reaching out for that grace? Are we at the point where we're going to say, Lord, I don't know, I don't have with me elderly people. My family is way in another country, or I have a family member that's far, but I'm not close to them, or I have a neighbor, but I'm not really close to them, right? So the grace is... If you have the grace, you can actually see the elderly in your family. You can actually see the elderly in your neighbors. And there is an appropriate response. Now, for the... Oh, too much anointing. <laughs> for those of us who are not seeing, it's possible that our heart is not yet tilled. It hasn't been even oh, right. fertilized. So the grace, even if there's a grace there, we our lack of response enables us not to act in a correct response. And if the longer we stay in that apathy, which is a moment where we actually don't think that's our business, or we actually don't feel we should do anything at this point, or we don't actually have to help the elderly, that state on where we lack the grace is actually purgatory time. Yeah. Because the grace is upon us. Yes. So those who are responding are actually exercising the theological virtue of charity and love, which is the one that encompasses the sins of omissions, our lack of love to our neighbors and even to ourselves. Yeah. So when we say, I do have the grace to take care of the elderly, guess what? First, there was someone in your life that prayed that you will have the grace. Second, you acted on that grace. The third is, Jesus will show himself in a tangible way to you where you can actually speak through the elderly to talk to you. So that you will avoid purgatory. So that you will have the grace of love. So that you don't have to suffer purgatory for a long time. It's an act of mercy for God. Your consolation is when you actually hear God talk through the elderly and the sick. Because there was a point in the Legion of Mary where I was just driving my, ch my family. I said, no, as a family, we're going to be Legion of Mary. And then it was hard for Patrick because he was working at the time. I had such little time with my family, and they were spending it in a nursing home. I said, do we even know these people? Why does oh. it smell so funny? It smells so Why funny. Why can't they clean the poopy smell out of this place? I was so upset. I'm it was like, so repulsive, and, right? And you know, and and I, you know, like some of the people that we met, it's like they're not even going to remember that we're here or that we came today. And I, I had so many strongholds not to go. I said, I just want some time with my family. Why are we going to these families? And I was so resistant until. I got exposed to these people, and I remember there was a, a woman, and she was all excited. You could see in the other room how they were wheeling her in, and we, they, she was coming to meet us, and she was really, really, really excited, and she got in there, and, and you saw her face fall when 
we came in when she saw that it was our family and she was expecting her children, right? And she didn't know who we were. And as much as I wanted to, I could not be her kid. I and and she just cried and and there was nothing I could do. I couldn't say it's gonna be okay or they're gonna come or we're gonna call them. Yeah. I could just be with her. And and this is a big deal for Jesus. I mean, when you're thinking about what are the important things I could do for Jesus, this is one of them, is just spending time with people that are sick or infirmed or ill or old and or forgotten. I have more than three testimony that actually Jesus revealed himself, like he showed up, like in a human way. <laughs> You know, Amen, not yes. in a mystical way, but in a human way that that's him, right? So the first one was when we were doing the Legion of Mary. You were talking about this Italian woman. Yes. And she had no family members visiting her. So she looked forward to for our visit. But on our last day, and this is when Jesus appeared, and I didn't know that it was our last day. Um, because every week we go, you know, and as a family. And there will always be a special moment where she would talk about how sad she is that no one visits her and that everyone in the nursing home were bad to her. Yeah, that she would tell people. her that story <laughs> and we would always play music to her. We would even play secular songs just to make her feel upbeat and for the entire community because we wanted them to have that momentary joy because we can sing and my kids can play the piano. So it was something that the nursing homes actually uh, looked forward to, to hear us sing. But our pastor, who was a traditionalist, actually told us, um, don't sing anything like that. Just sing Catholic songs, you know. But, you know... I know that some of them know, you know, the secular song that makes you happy, but it's still a good song, right? Yeah, there was. But anyway, as as time was progressing, we were doing it maybe for two years of our life in the Legion of Mary. That night, when that day where it was gonna be our last day, I didn't know that there was no more next time. But when I was talking to this woman, all of a sudden, she was like. Choking like this, like, like that. Like, I said, are you okay? I, like, there was something, like, blocking her. Like, she wanted to say something, but there's something, like, stopping her. Mm -hmm. And she was saying something. So, so slowly, like, her voice, which is a womanly voice, turned to, like, a man's voice. A powerful man's voice. That sounded to me like, wait, you know, the devil was not in my mind then, so I don't know about the demons. We didn't have a possession yet. But he actually, like that, and he, and he, and she spoke, or God spoke, and she said, I am happy that you visited me. And then it was another voice. It was Jesus. Thank you. And, and I was like, <laughs> Patrick, <laughs> did you hear that? You know, because there was no doubt that it was Jesus. And then it, it was like, it blew my mind that it was preparing me on the time that that my that my grandma will will be actually going into that state of dementia too yeah and you know we were able to take care of both of us with you know my grandma and then um again Jesus appeared to us when she was lying in bed and it was 2 a.m. and we had she has us feeding tube, and we have to give her food every two hours. So Patrick and I were like, we're so sleepy. Mm -hmm. But we have to, 
you know, we ha- we always take the night shift so my my family members can have a good rest while we're visiting. And then when we were taking off my grandma, she would hold Patrick in a certain way and her eyes will change and it looked like the eyes of Jesus. It was it had a gentle face and when she would look at us like that's not my grandma. <laughs> it was actually Jesus. Yeah. And, and we look at each other and said, I can't believe this, you know. So that's the second time. And then the third time is when I was taking care of my mom. And then, you know, I knelt down because I wanted to change her slippers, right? And, and I was changing her slippers so she can go to, and bring her to the bathroom. I was putting the shoes, one of the, one of the feet, feet was a manly feet. My mom is so like, that's <laughs> my feet, feminine. it's so feminine and thin. And the other one turned to a manly feet. And then I said, oh, Jesus is here, like in my heart, you know, it jumped. And then when I look at her, it's the eyes of Jesus again. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> And then, oh my, cherry pie. But it was in the stillness of night. Everything was quiet, you know. But for me, that's my testimony. When the, when Jesus said, he is with the sick, he is really with the sick. Right, and it's important for us to understand um, that even the things that we do for each other, and, and I, since those things happen to both of us, um, when I make coffee for Joy, I, I always think I'm going to make the best coffee because, you know, she's my Jesus. And when I'm with my dad and I was giving him a shower yesterday, I, I'm, I'm very careful not to complain because I know that I'm going to see that I'm complaining about Jesus. So Jesus has this beautiful story that he's given us that I'd like to share with you about how he plays hide and seek. And so because he has made each one of us and he's, he's put the impression of himself on our hearts, he's able to dwell inside of us, all of us. Any, any one person he's created is made in the image of Christ and he is able um, to be inside of those people, even people that are, are, are oppressed and have demonic influence and stuff. He's able to to do this, and um, and what I what I think is beautiful is that when he says to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole self, and to love your neighbor as yourself, he's really telling you to love Jesus and others, and to work for Jesus and to find them. And I and I always think Talon's going to say something soon because he's raising his hand. Ten he times. always <laughs> thinks that. The ones that are hardest to find Jesus, you you really gotta you gotta know that okay, this one's a hard one. Be and patient. Be patient because <laughs> because he's there. He's in there. So even if if and this is this we have to get used to not painting people black and white. Yes. Right? Because what the Lord had said, even about those people that are possessed, and this is a personal revelation, is as long as they have breath. He dwells within them as long as we have breath. So it doesn't matter if it's if it's, you know, a person who is handicapped mentally or Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton. Those people, Jesus, we can't condemn someone and take the place of God. We actually have to do what what is God asking me to do for this person? Sometimes. Praying for mercy is the best thing to do if you can't do much, you know, is to pray for mercy for those people. But we'll be accountable for how we judge others, how we view others, and how we treat others. Okay, Talon. So Jesus is always in the suffering. So if someone's suffering, Jesus is in them. And so but what I've seen and through our ministry, that we will always encounter a certain type of person in their suffering, whether they are obnoxious or if they're sick or any type of suffering until we're able to see Christ in them. Yeah, it's like the teaching doesn't go away. We have to, we're going to 
find another soul like that because our Lord wants us to learn to love. So yeah. the example of Celia Sandoval from California when she said, I saw the eyes of Jesus in a homeless man. And I that's true. I can confirm that because when we were in South Carolina, we live in a neighbor in a neighborhood of a very poor a, lot, a very poor neighborhood. And there was a homeless man. It was Sunday and he was wearing a suit, right? But there was something funny though. Okay, so he he put his head on the window where I was, not on the driver's seat, you know, on the across Patrick. And he told me, can I get a ride? <laughs> and then I, I look at, at him. So on those circumstances, as a woman, you still have to discern because you cannot just pick up any homeless person, right? Yeah, right. You have right. to discern, are you going to be safe? Um, you have to discern, if you're, is your family member with you if they have drugs or they're afflicted you know you have have to have a game plan on how to handle it right so i asked patrick so what do you think you know so i i gave him the authority to make the decision for our family because it can really pull your heart strings right the devil can pull your heart strings right or you know so anyway, long story short, I said, oh, I'm sorry because we have to go to church, which where we are actually going to church at that time. And then, as, I, as we said, as, I, we as, as we were pulling away, I look at his feet and he had no shoes. He was in a suit. He had no shoes. And then he disappeared. <laughs> So, and I, I, and I'm glad. I'm, you know what? This is. I'm so glad that because the Lord has just given me a download about this. I think we need to change. And this is maybe this is for you, the some of you that are watching right now. This is a message for you. The Lord wants us to change our view of purgatory, because He gives us all these opportunities to know Him, and. Not every one of those opportunities are going to bear fruit. And he's okay with that. So he'll repeat a lesson over. And it's not like a test that you're wrong, you don't get into heaven. It is sort of like we're walking and, and learning to know, love, and serve Christ. So it's not about getting something wrong and being punished in purgatory. Purgatory is a preparation room so that when I go in, I go confident as a child of God and not not like, oh, I could have done better. There will be no person leaving purgatory saying I could have done better because they did. Now this is, so Joy and I used to teach catechism and it was probably the funnest catechism class you've ever had because this is actually catechism. And Joy and I would teach it and we had a pretty rowdy group. So rowdy that Joy got a squirt gun full of holy water, okay? Just to, just to put the kids in place, right? And, and she, she knew how to use it, right? So I would come in to the, the classroom and the kids were all yelling and screaming and jumping around. And I'd say, okay, everybody, pop quiz. And then they would yell, no fair. And this is why we do pop quizzes, because we've been doing this for a long time, a long time. And when they would, they say, we're not prepared. How can we take this pop quiz? The kids would yell. They would complain just like the dogs. Hold on. Don't, you have to wait for the dogs to calm down. Okay. So, so I would give them the test, and they would all, the majority of everybody failed, except for that one kid whose father was a professor at the Abbey, right? Oh, yeah. He passed. Everyone else failed, and they said it was not fair. And so I went through the test, and I corrected the test, and I gave everyone's paper back, and they was like, we can't give this to, you know, the priest. We failed. And I said, that's okay. In a little bit, we'll take the test again. 
And they said, well, when are we going to take the test again? And then I yelled out, pop quiz! And they're like, we're not ready, we're not ready. And, and I would give them the questions and they would all scramble for the answers. Now this time, one third of the class passed, but they got like C's and D's, right? And we went through all the answers, gave them all the right answers. And, and they're like, still not fair, still not fair. I said, that's okay, pop quiz. And we kept on giving the same test over and over and over again. And as long as there was someone in that class who didn't get it, we would keep on giving the test. And the people that got D's got C's. The people that got C's got B's. And then everybody passed. And this is purgatory. This is, it, it, it is our Lord teaching us who he is and how we should respond the right way. And, and also, um, it's our Lord's way to, to keep us all united as a church. Uh, we are the church militants, yeah. and the church triumphant is the one in heaven, right, Alan? And then the church purified. What is the, ch the church suffering? The church suffering is the one in purgatory. So it's a church. It's part of the church. So when we are the body of Christ and we're united like this, we can help each other, right? We can help the souls in purgatory, and the souls in purgatory can help us. And for me, I I live that. Is that a doctrine? I live that doctrine or dogma or I think it's a doctrine, right? Is teaching. purgatory or a teaching talent? Well, well, it but, depends on what you, where you're going. I don't know. I think it's a doctrine. Okay, talent will find the answer. But the the point I'm trying to say is because I live through a supernatural experience of this. My relationship with the souls in purgatory is real, you know? Like, if I'm forgetting them, they actually knock. Yeah. They knock and tell me, we need prayers. So yeah. I really have to wake up and actually, okay, the souls of purgatory need prayer. So it's a doctrine, right? So for me to be able to explain it now to a Protestant, you know, I have to be ready to explain it biblically and I have to be able to prepare to explain it in a story. So one story, though, that's why for those who have, who have children that died of um, suicide, that's why for me I understand the mercy of God is there was one day when we were already married, but we were newly married at the time. It's like yesterday. And then I woke up, and there was a letter in my vision, in my dream, I don't know if I was still dreaming, but there was like a letter, the par avion. You know, this is the letter in our generation where you, you air mail something, then it has a different, oh, right. uh, different. Um, yeah, it has like colors around the edges. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's air mail. Yeah. Right. That's coming from a different country. So this is what you saw. Yeah, that was what I saw. And. In that air mail is a lot of blood around, blood around, blood around it like this, like in a triangle kind of blood around it. And it showed the name of my friend. And I would ask all of us to pray for him. His name is Rico Talent. Can you, can Rico. you put it? R-I-C-O, -I Rico. Maybe we can just stop and pray for him. Eternal and rest grant to Rico, Rico, O Lord, and, and let your perpetual light shine, shine upon him. him. May, May he rest in peace. peace. Amen. Amen. So he is my childhood friend, and like we grew up together, and he has a crush on me, but I never fell in love with him. So we were just really close friends, you know, and we were classmates in college, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyway. Um, he went, he had a relationship, he fell in love with a married woman, you know, in our, in our place, but I never heard anything about him anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, no stories at all for like maybe 20 years, right? He's in the Philippines. Anyway, when, when, I, when, when I got that vision, I immediately know 
that is for him. That dream is for him. So for me, I wanted to know why I was being sent that envelope, why there was blood in it, and why his name was there. Because so, it's a message from heaven, right? So those are the three the three things that we, we say when we're given a mission from God. What do I need to learn? What do I need to do? And who do I need to love? So Joy applied that to this. So you started to ask people, right? You, you, yeah, so you went I, to your friends. And, I contacted my best friend in California and said, Oh, I'm so bad. I Maybe I... Rico needs prayers because I really didn't catch up or follow up with him. I don't know where he is. I don't know. I, I'm, I did not care anymore where he was because I'm in love. And, you know, I don't remember anyone because I'm focused on Patrick. Or maybe that's it. You know, I'm getting all those guilt things. And then my my friend said, don't you know she, he committed suicide? Oh. I said, what? How? You know, because he was always a good, holy person. He was very holy, like we talked about God, and he was a good gentleman, like he was a gentleman, and he was, he, he really helped me a lot in, you know, we, he was fun to be with. He's a fun person, very respectful, very understanding, etc. So I started to pray for him, but this is a blast from the past asking for prayers. Yeah. So purgatory is real. So, so, so what it meant, and we had many, many stories. I mean, if you guys if you've traveled through and gone to our workshops, you'll see many different stories where we've ministered to someone and they passed over and God was merciful. And so, so here it was, it, it was a clue that who she needed, what she needed to know is that he died and that he was in purgatory. That's what she needed to know. And it's a suicide what, case. Yep, and, and then what you need to do was pray for him, right? And who you need to love was Rico, right? And this is that, so mission accomplished. And so those missions are, are beautiful. And we tend to think, you know, like I remember, and I'll end with this because we're two minutes from Fish Friday. Um, <laughs> this is, I remember when we went into a, you know, we were touring around the United States three times in Canada, looping three times a year and i remember one of the bigger conferences that we were going to have in king street south carolina at the shrine of our lady of joyful hope where we would end up living right behind um i was looking forward to this because our lady of joyful hope that we were joyful missionaries and i'm coming in and when i get there there's only three people that showed up oh yes and i was so depressed i was so sad i was like they had no idea how much it took for us to get there, to, to put this thing together, and only three people showed up. And there was even a homeless woman that we got on from the streets, and she asked to use the bathroom, and she washed herself up, and she sat there. So then we had four people. And I, my heart was broken, and I said to the Lord, you know what, Lord, I'll do anything for you, but I really wish that there were more people at this conference so more people would be saved. And I'm a little disappointed, Lord, that you asked me to do this for just four people. And the Lord had given me a lesson and he had corrected me. And he said that every, that when he made us in his image, he made us as family. Just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a family that cannot be divided. And he made us in an image for us not to be alone, but to be connected with each other. And that this is the reason why he sent his son into our DNA so that Jesus could say the word us and represent us. And that's why he is the judge and he is the just judge because he has gone through everything that we have possibly have gone through so he can truly judge us and represent us. And then our Lord said, that every single one of those persons that are in this room, this church, that are going through the workshop are connected to a lineage of people. And they are representing their family line far in the past and far in the future. And he says, those souls are waiting anticipation 
for the people that I have called, these four, to represent them so they can be set free by my blood. And then he said to me, Patrick, my son, look back into the church. Look again. Look again. And the church was packed. The church was packed. Standing room only. All in the rafters. All the souls. All over. Amen. Amen. And that was, I, I just want to cap that with, with all of us knowing that when we go to the workshop, we're actually representing everyone, right? So when Patrick and I got married, and this is the chapter, Chapter 3 of The Secrets of Joy. Oh, which I hope you read this I hope today. I'm able. No, I'm not able to release it. I haven't written okay, it. Okay, Chapter 3. I'm Make still on remember. a draft. I'm not on the final draft. But anyway, this Chapter 3, which is the upcoming chapter, and if you want to read it, it's in the Patreon site, right? But anyway, that third chapter involves um, the call of God for Patrick and me to a marriage. And we didn't know at the time why God is calling us to a marriage when we're not ready to be married financially. We're not ready to explain to everyone that we, we're going to get married, right? Because the courtship happened so fast within six months, <laughs> right? But there were you only know you know. <laughs> two, set, two, author, two sets of authority that we consulted and which God allowed us to consult. But we want to seek more spiritual direction. The first one was the parents of Patrick, dad, and grandma Rose, where we asked permission, and then my parents, right? And they're both super Catholic, right. and they said yes. I thought for sure they would have said no. But anyway, fast forward, when we had our Catholic wedding, no one came. Not a single person. Not a single person came. And I, I mean, was we like, were there. I the can't believe was there. it. In my first marriage, our kids were there. Everyone was there. You know, it was just us, right. our, our immediate family. Uh, my first marriage, everybody showed up. Guys from my high school showed up. Yeah, but in, a, every in our marriage, it up. was just our spiritual director, our immediate family, you know, our best friend. And then no one was there in that big church. So I look around. I said, Lord. We were so poor as church mice. Our, our uh, wedding cake was lemon bars from, from Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we, we haven't really gotten married yet. The party is <laughs> not. We're going to invite you we to our party. We didn't have a reception. Our reception. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, our Lord showed me all the saints and souls in purgatory in our wedding. Like our oh, Lord. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, our Lord, I wrote that. I, our Lord was telling us that our marriage was very important to God and everyone in heaven was rejoicing. So I told Patrick, the Why would the heavens <laughs> rejoice? We're getting married. What's this? We didn't know we have a mission. We didn't know no, we, didn't we had know. a ministry. But we were like, why would the heavens rejoice? Right? Yeah. The heavens rejoice when you two were joined. Yes, yeah. Yes. No, that was that, the that, exact words, words because that I read it to. That's why I'm keeping talent because talent memorizes all all the mystical things that happen to exactly. us. He has right. that embedded in yeah. his heart. The Lord no, it, 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 was really it was really important that the Lord um, used this as a victory banner for those that were broken, for marriages that fell apart, to give you hope that even in a demonic manifestation, uh, losing our house, um, all the, the violence that happened to us, that this is what it looks like at the end of the tunnel, that, that God... Well, I just want, remembered something, one more, 30 more seconds, if I may have your attention. <laughs> but i just like to share it. I can't, because this, this is related to the mission where we are in right now. Because eventually, in the, in the near future, we're going to like share with you the rule of life that we're going to use for the formation of everyone. But anyway... Yes. It's not yet defined, but it's almost there. Right? It's being formed. But as you know, we were Benedictine Oblates. As Benedictine Oblates, we made a promise in front of the Holy Eucharist to live our life according to the rule of St. Benedict and as our state of life permits. So we're going to have another episode to define what 
is a state of life. What is the state of life of a single person? What is your state of what life? What is yeah. the state of life of a married person or a ordained priest or a nun? What or does that mean? I mean, this has been unpacked to us lately. So we are excited for the fourth workshop because the fourth workshop will explain the different state of life and what's our mission in each of it. But anyway, I'm just too excited. But my point that I wanted to say is though... Our oblate was just very a tiny was just a tiny group at that time. After we made Patrick and I and Sierra made that oblate promise to 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 our Lord in front of the Eucharist, I just I just knew, like God gave me a vision that it was not just Jesus in that we were in front of. Right. We were in front of all the Benedictines that existed in time. So we're talking about 405th century saints that yeah. actually have formed the civilization, the Western civilization that protected the Bible, that made the schools, that protected the culture of life so that our faith can be propagated. They're backing us up. Yes. So, oh, I'm getting an anointing. <laughs> so this mission, when the enemy will try to destroy our civilization, you know, we have a piece of that puzzle. We have a piece on how we're going to restore civilization. Amen. We, we have a part of it. And, oh, this is just amazing. <laughs> and... You know, just knowing all that string of Benedictines, we're just going to have another episode for you to understand how many saints, how many Benedictines became Pope, how many Benedictines, what is their contribution to the world. That's just another episode, yeah. right? No, it's amazing. But you will be flabbergasted on the contributions of the Benedictines that you might all be Benedictus, but you know, wouldn't it's a be call, bad. It it's a call. Be bad. But anyway, I, I'm just excited to share this with all of you. So in continuing the mission, all what we know is because we made a promise to God, which means the Lord promises that he will use our Benedictine spirituality for spiritual warfare with the antichrist Amen. because god promised along with the franciscans that this religious community will live until the end of times amen that's so true Woo! message delivered well it's good to have you guys with us we are excited i don't know how we're gonna calm down Woo! calm down joy <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the unity prayer. In the name of the Father, Father and the Son, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. My adorable, adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together, may our hands gather in unity, may our hearts beat in unison, may our souls be in harmony, may our thoughts be as one, may our ears listen to the silence together, may our glances profoundly penetrate each other, May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. O Papa God, Holy Spirit, O my Jesus, we praise you, we bless you, and we thank you. O Lord, in your compassion, pour upon us your children, your precious blood from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Blessed Mother, wrap us in your holy mantle of love and protection to blind, thwart, and conquer the enemy. Chaste heart of St. Joseph, tear our demons, protect and guide our faith. St. Michael, defend us in battle. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. All you souls in purgatory, pray for us as we pray for you. Lord Jesus, we ask you to seal this conversation now from its very beginning to its very end. In your most holy name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. I trust in you. May the holy cross be my light. Non draco seat me dukes. Let not the dragon be my guide. Vade retro satana nunquam suade mihi vana. Sunt mala quae libas ipse venena bibas. Begone, Satan, do not touch with thy vanities. 
That would drop from me as evil. Drink, Drink the, the poison, poison yourself. Max. Give us strength. 